Welcome to Smart Music's presentation, Building Foundations for Jazz Improvisation. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our wonderful presenters today. Bob Sinecrope is a consummate educator. In 1974, he founded and continues to direct the award-winning jazz program at Milton Academy, where Aaron Goldberg and Stephen Lehman are graduates. Bob has also taught for Jamie Abersold's summer jazz workshop since 1980. A past president of the Jazz Education Network, Bob served on its board for nine years. In 2007, Bob became the inaugural recipient of the John Laporta Jazz Educator of the Year. And in 2010, he received a Downbeat Jazz Education Achievement Award, as well as a National Youth Development Service Award. Bob has made his mark internationally over the past six decades with clinics in schools on six continents. And he is an active bassist and band leader, having performed over the years with Eric's Eric Alexander, Jerry Bagonzi, Randy Brecker, Chris Potter, the Boston Pops, the Artie Shaw Band, and so many more. I encourage you to take a look at Bob's website as my short little intro can't even come close to covering the incredible amount of opportunities Bob has had in the world of jazz, both as a performer and an educator. We also have the wonderful Ted Scalzo joining us today. As many of you may know, Ted is an incredibly knowledgeable music educator who has retired from Bayshore Schools and Hofstra University and is currently an education specialist and clinician for Make Music. Thank you both so much for being with us today. Bob and Ted, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Michaela. That was really a nice introduction. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> Before we let uh, Bob take over the microphone and uh, show you his wonderful method, um, it's important that the audience understands this is not going to be a demonstration of how smart music works. Um, if you're interested in that kind of information, it's on our website. Go and uh, check it out, smartmusic.com. And we have wonderful resources to help you uh, understand how smart music operates um, for all kinds of uh, music education. Today's session is specifically about Bob and his method. And um, with that in mind, um, let's uh, get Bob to uh, start off our program because I'm so excited for him to share this wonderful, unique method um, that I've had uh, firsthand, um, let's say, um, insight into how he's uh, developed it. And um, as an educator, I would have loved to have had this book when I first started teaching. This is just a, a great resource. So Bob, it's, on, it's all on your shoulders now. Great. Welcome, everybody. I hope you're well. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I assume you can see my screen. Um, and um, yes, I'm so excited about this opportunity that Smart Music has given me to um, share this uh, series of books. So I want to just tell you a little bit about um, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so there's a series of books uh, under the uh, big title of Pathways Towards Greatness. Uh, jazz improvisation for everyone. And basically, um, the goals of this book, it's a series of several improv and bass, walking baseline books as applied to basic jam session tunes. And it's really a method for learning and graining and utilizing chord tones and jazz solos and bass lines. It's really an attempt to put a method book embedded in an exercise book. So uh, my motto is learn by doing. And the real value of this series is not only being able to play the exercises in smart music, but to take the concepts and apply them on the bandstand. Um, just a, another ad additional insight. There are lots of different routes to learning the jazz language. I'm not pretending this is the only way to go. Um, there's and but this is a way to go. It focuses on chord tones, which is a little bit unusual pathway. Um, and the title of the book is Pathways, to acknowledge that there's different ways you can go to learn. And it also it's towards greatness, not to greatness, because we really seldom reach that goal of greatness. So the important thing is that this is one of many methods, but I think it's a, a well-organized one, and it's pretty comprehensive, and it's to get you to be better. <laughs> That's really what it is. And finally, what I'd like to say is that the best way to learn how to improvise is to go to recordings and really try to emulate those. I mean, there's no substitute for learning uh, 
jazz language the same way you learned how to speak your spoken language. You just emulated what you heard. And by the time you were two or three years old, you could speak in your native language and express yourself. And that's the best way really to learn jazz language. Uh, this is kind of a bridge to that. But that it's, it's please don't think that this is a substitute for digging in and getting inspired by the masters. OK, so uh, these are some of the features of the book. Um, and we got wonderful endorsements from Randy Brecker, Gordon Goodwin, uh, Victor Wooten. OK, so um, these exercises, um, again, are really uh, a method. It's a there's, it's a pathway. Um, there's four different backing tracks because there's so many exercises in the improv books. There's a piano bass drums, a guitar bass drums, a B3 drums and a bass drum, uh, bass and drums only for variety. Um, and it's a method of learning chord tones and then how to use them. And that'll become clear. There's a lot of hyperlinks in here. Uh, it's good for all instruments, oboe, bassoon, tuba, viola. Um, and of course, the standard jazz instruments. Um, and there's just, as I said, lots of hyperlinks that go and explain in greater detail. And the series of books that are planned are, uh, they've got some funny names, Strong from My Father, Cantaloupe on Land, uh, but it's basically tunes that you'd hear at a jam session. Um, so in other words, it's theory applied specifically to tunes. And I think that's the, the uh, beauty and makes this method unique. So um, the first improv book is F Blues. And again, this is a hyperlink. It tells you a little bit of background about blues. And you'll see in a second where you can get to this link. Um, and here is the sort of the overall outline of not only the F Blues, but basically uh, all, all the books that are in the series, that are planned in the series. If a tune like the F Blues or Watermelon Man or Song from My Father can have one scale like a minor pentatonic or a minor blue scale, then that's the first chapter. But if something like All the Things You Are or Perdido or Take the A Train, where that's not appropriate, then we'll start right in um, with one chord tone. So of course, this tune has, uh, can take the minor pentatonic blue scale. Uh, and so basically, basically uh, let, well, let's go back here. So, we go on to the one chord tone uh, where we begin learning the chord tones and that's a leap up from most beginners uh, who you know love the blues scale love the minor pentatonic scale but to get in there and really expand your jazz language you really need to be able to know scales and chord tones so the next chapter is chord tones the following chapter is how to use two chord tones and then the next chapter is how to use three chord tones and the next chapter is how to use four chord tones. And then we get into how to add flavor and color to your uh, pro, uh, notes, chord tones using approach notes. And then there's some sim, uh, solos. Um, and one of the features I, I didn't mention yet is that there's a variety of repeated rhythms. I find as an improv teacher that when students focus on chord tones, they often, their rhythms don't necessarily sound very good. So all the exercises, uh, repeat rhythms for 12 measures so you can ingrain rhythms that I think are really good. And inherent in all these exercises are things like voice leading, passing tones, forward motion, all these great concepts. Okay, here we go. So on this first uh, chapter, we have six different exercises on the minor pentatonic, and they start out pretty simply, and they get to more advanced. Uh, you can see that this is basically Here's the scale up and down. You can see the rhythms are simple. Um, and the next subchapter is minor blues. Um, and this is exercise C3. <laughs> and you can see that that's get a little bit more complex rhythmically. And then the final subchapter of the one scale orientation is um, major blues which some people don't know about and it's really a cool scale and again if you look up here you see these hyperlinks and if you click on these hyperlinks it will take you to smart music and um there there you go to the hyperlink with an explanation of major blues scale and i'll just give you a sneak peek these are some of the hyperlinks all these uh kinds of concepts 
and uh, there's some videos here. There's some really good stuff that um, uh, that that would be very useful. Okay, let's go back to there. We go. Okay, so that's the first chapter. Uh, the next chapter is where we begin our expo exploration of mastering chord tones, and the first chapter is learning one chord tone at a time and um you can see that this first exercise on the le left is internalizing roots and again there's a hyperlink here there's a different hyperlink here the rhythms are pretty simple but they're repetitive that's that's again inherent in these exercises is lots of really good stuff and so this is just can you play this rhythm and you can see that in the second chorus, I changed the rhythm a little bit. And this is internalizing the thirds. Uh, and again, I changed the rhythms a little bit. And of course, there's the internalizing the fifths and internalizing the sevenths. So that's the first chapter. Um, and I want to repeat that if you can play these exercises, that's a good start. But what you want to be able to do is do this to any tune you work with. Can you go and apply this concept? Can you learn all the thirds, all the fifths, and all the sevenths, and all the roots? If you can, then you're on your way to really being able to uh, um, widen your uh, vocabulary. Uh, there's a term here that I couldn't find, so I invented one. I call it defining tones. And basically, the tones that define the chord. Uh, it's pretty close to the concept of chord tones, but chord tones can also be uh, color tones, sorry, but chord color tones can also be ninths and uh, 13th and all, and I wanted a thing that was more narrowly uh, defining the chord. Okay, the next chapter is how to use two chord tones at a time. So this has some subchapters, and the first subchapter is internalizing two chord tones. Can you do exercises using the root and third? Can you do root and fifth, root and seventh? Uh, so there's all six different pairs of, of chord tones from a seventh chord. Then the next subchapter is can you voice leading these? And I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate in a second. Uh, and there's nine exercises there. Then can you use passing tones between these two chord tones? Um, so that would be uh, if you go root to the third, you'd put the second in there. Um, and then the last subchapter is can you voice lead these passing tones? So this is pretty useful stuff. Um, and again, the beauty of smart music is that you get to learn by doing. Um, and once you learn by doing with the smart music, that's like the training wheels, then try to take the training wheels off and apply this to tunes, you know, that are other than the F blues. So um, here's what some of the exercises look like. Uh, so this is just the roots and the thirds, and you can see just the exercise. And by the way, in the second group of 12 bars, we reverse the order. This is not something that's inconsequential. Roots, thirds are fine, but can you start with the third to the root? A lot of beginners can't do that very easily, so here's an opportunity to do it. Also, you can see there's lots of labeling on this, and this is kind of the mantra, listen, sing, and play. You really want to internalize the music. And so you can see here now the next subchapter of voice leading, we take what we learned here and we combine these. So when the chord changes, our melody line stays uh, relatively, uh, moves very little. In fact, in this case, it doesn't move at all for some of it. So let's play these exercises and see what happens. And again, we're gonna go right directly to smart music and I'm gonna go to swing and um, let's try and see what happens. Okay, so that's just the root and the third. Um, and now, once we master the roots and the thirds and the thirds, fifths and the sevenths and all sorts of other things, we can combine those and we get this, which is kind of closer to music. Uh, that other one 
even though it might have sounded good, it's, it's more of an exercise. But this is a more useful way. Okay, so that happened to also be a B3 and drums. That's one of our backing tracks. Hey, Bob, just um, I want to interrupt just for a second here so that everybody understands sure. how smart music's behaving. So I don't know if everyone caught when he played, um, he had the exercise play the line for you. <clears throat> he selected one of the jazz feels so that it interpreted the music exactly in the style that it needed to be. So he was selecting standard swing. And that's why the, the uh, melody was playing back in a swing style, which is something if you're using smart music with your students or yourself, you're going to want to do and you need to know about that. So I appreciate that he showed it to you. And I just want to make sure everybody understood um, how that works. Um, if um, you're using it with a student and they're recording themselves, smart music will tell them whether they're playing the right notes or not. And if you don't select swing, they're going to have a lot of uh, feel rhythmic errors. Um, so it's important that you do select that swing style. All right. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Ted. Um, okay. So then going on, the next thing would be using passing tones, as I said, and uh, then voice leading. So let's look at some examples of that. So you can see in here now we're starting to get some syncopated rhythms and here's a hype, uh, hyperlink telling you about passing tones. Um, just some uh, encouragement, sing and play your core tones, be, you know, uh, to, to help internalize the sound. And again, these are repeated rhythms that are labeled. Um, and, you know, this is just, can you play the thirds, fourths and fifths? But in this exercise, which is the last subchapter, can you voice lead those? So for instance, for this chord, it's the three, four, five, but if you want a voice lead, you could go to the root two, three. So this is a really important skill. I don't see this taught very often. And again, the beauty of smart music is that it allows this to happen for you to, you can hear it and you can get feedback. It's, it's really a nice marriage of sort of a theory and a practice, right brain and left brain. Um, so this is great stuff and there's, I forget how many, I think there's nine of these, these voice leading things. Um, so you could, uh, um, there's just lots of options. Uh, again, this isn't something, if you want to get the real value that you can get out of this, it, it's not something you can do in a week or two. It, it would be, you know, several months, but you would come out with, you would really accelerate your ability to express yourself. Okay, um, so we're moving on. The next chapter is how to deal with three chord tones. And just because of the scope of the trying to add the, the root three, five, and the seventh, I limited it to just the triads, the root th thirds and fifths. If you can do the two chord uh, exercises and you've really got those ingrained, um, it's, not, it's not a big step to, to add to the triads. So um, I purposely, by design, left the sevenths out. And the subchapters are triad inversions. And, uh, you know, there's six different permutations of these. And then again, triad inversions with voice leading. And then I just created some solos with voice leading uh, with triads. Um, so let's take a look at some of those exercises. Um, so this is the standard root three, five, root three, five. And another nice feature of smart music is that you don't have to assign or you if you're a student you're just using this directly you don't have to do the whole exercise you can just um, select the measures you want it to play over and over and over and you could just do the first 12 bars and that might be good for a student who's really beginning and then after the do that you could have the student do the next 12 bars so you can see once again the feature of this is that you're going root three five for the first course Second chorus, you're doing five, three root. Again, that's really valuable. Uh, that's something that often gets overlooked. It's not just the notes themselves, it's the arrangements of the notes, which gives you variety. And of course, the, the always present hyperlinks. 
And so you can see here, what we do is that we've taken this exercise, just the root three, five, and we've combined the different permutations to voice lead. Let's play this. Looks ready to go. And that, that back, backing track is just bass and drums. So that's something that's really go, uh, good to do. Uh, it will help the students to hear the harmony implied in the bass line. Listeners uh, might want to know about, so right now Bob's has it playing my part. So that's another option. You don't have to have smart music play the part for the student you could un or deselect it and it just it won't play that part for the student he'll just hear the backing track so the student then is just focusing on their sound um, but if the student needs that support it's there in smart music so i just want to make sure everybody understood that you could have it on or off yeah um yeah smart music is it's it's, it's pretty amazing um I've been using it a long time, but I'm getting much, uh, much deeper into it. And the grade book, it's just such an easy way. I love the way that students, when they submit, if, if you're in a class and you have a teacher, when they submit something, they can write, you know, a sentence or two about like, wow, this was a great exercise, or boy, I had trouble with this. And the teacher will receive a screenshot, um, an MP3, and, um, uh, and a score, a numerical score that you can, you can assign from one to 10 or uh, one to 100 or something. And the teacher can go in and listen to it because even though you could get 100, you might not have good phrasing or might not have a good sound. Um, and the teacher can listen to that. It's, you know, in this era of COVID, the loss of ensemble is, is really pretty devastating. But I actually think I can do a better job as a teacher helping my students learn individual skills remotely because what they, they send me their assignments here and I comment that back to them. And if they're in my classroom, either I have to stop the group to you know, critique the solo or I have to go over while somebody else is playing. And if I say, look in the seventh bar, you, know, you played a great rhythm and the kid's gonna say, what? Whereas here it's recorded. And so we can not only hear, we can see it. So it's an amazing, amazing tool that I hope to continue to use once we get past COVID era. Okay, moving on. Uh, four chord tones, root three, five, seven. Um, again, if you, if you can do the roots and the, if the pairs and the voice leading and the passing tones and the triads, um, this isn't gonna be such a big leap. So all I did was do permutations of these. Uh, and there's 24 different permutations. Um, and, you know, basically you can just work on learning those. Um, and you can see the rhythms here, they get pretty interesting. Um, we've started to get a concept called forward motion. And there's a hyperlink on that. Um, basically forward motion says that the first beat of the measure should be your target note almost all of us always start our ideas on beat one or after one but actually this should be the last part of your phrase because this is the resolution place and you want to end you want to end your phrase on resolution places so here we're starting to get to where you uh, can do that concept um, by playing pickups it's a revolutionary concept that uh, when i learned it for me in my playing and my teaching uh, and Hal Galper is definitely the expert on this, and I was lucky to connect with him and, and learn from him. So it's, it's inherent in these exercises, especially as we get deeper into the woods. You can see the rhythms get a little bit more complex. Okay. Um, and then we get to really cool stuff. Um, and you can't really tackle this until you've really learned the, the uh, chord tones. But this is really 
really will take you in playing to another level. So this chapter, I call it approach notes, and it's basically ways to create tension and you resolve them. So this first one has what we call lower chromatic, and of course there's uh, hyperlinks here, um, lower chromatic to the uh, root, and that's what this first 12 bars are about. And then what we do is we go above the note and play a, a, you know, a note that's not resolved and we resolve it. So, you know, all art is a back and forth between um, tension and resolution. Without tension, um, there's no incentive for the music to move. So this is a great way to introduce tension that gets resolved. Um, and one of the exercises then goes to what we call double chromatic, where you back up the note, you know, two places. Um, and I'm going to play this exercise. Let's see how that goes. This is easy stuff conceptually. Uh, if you've got good handle of your chord tones, it's not so hard, but it takes it takes a lot of skill. Let's see if this. Mm -hmm. Now, um, <laughs> I'm going to be a little playful here. I don't think anybody wants to hear a whole chorus of that. But again, to ingrain this, you know, again, it's not it's not going to be that useful if all you can do is the exercise and then you walk away and you can't do it. You need to take this away and make it yours in ownership. So. Um, the Talent Code is a great book, uh, and there's a hyperlink to some uh, how to learn in there. Um, repeated, repeating things over and over and over, that helps you own them. I love the word ownership. Um, so that's pretty cool. And you can see if that's mixed in with other kinds of stuff that just gets you the beginnings of tension. And then what we can do um, is we can do what's called enclosures, um, where it's like, by the way, that was a cello, here's a viola, and you heard that was a piano bass drum track. Uh, you can go below the note, and you go above the note, and it's like, please, 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 and then you resolve the, the chord to the chord tone. And again, these are all labeled, there's hyperlinks in here, and you can see we're really getting to forward motion now. In fact, this not only ends on the beat, it, it anticipates beat one. This is a very, very strong way to play. This is another perfect example of um, forward motion. It's an incredible concept that just will change your playing. Um, and once you start to hear it this way, it, it gets annoying to hear it when it's not that way. Anyway, so this is just upper scale or lower uh, double chromatic and just different ways to uh, create tension. Um, and then the last chapter is just some examples that I, uh, created of trying to create uh, solos that incorporated all the concepts uh, in the book. So it's kind of like a, a summation. Um, and um, I think they're pretty good. Um, and I, I have to say, I just sat down and played them as best I could. Um, and, um, and then I would go and edit it and make sure they made sense. So that is the uh, F Blues book. And um, uh, these are some of the hyperlinks. Uh, I already showed them to you. Um, and um, dominant cycle, forward motion, passing notes. Uh, some awesome bass players. We're going to get to that in a second. I want to share with you the bass book. If I think we're going to have plenty of time. Um, permutations, enclosures, um, lots of really good stuff. Bob, you know what I love about the book is the fact that it does start at a fundamental basic level that all instrumentalists could embrace and the fact that you've um the book is accessible to an instrument like a cello um means a lot to us a, a, a public school student who you know maybe the, the the kids that are in the jazz ensemble get to do this kind of stuff but we don't but what you've done is you've opened a door here 
And you've now made this accessible to all those other instruments. And I really want to applaud you for that. And that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about your, your book. And then the other thing um, is clearly your lineage, the experiences you've had with other educators, other professional musicians have um, evolved into this book because you're taking them from, again, this fundamental um, chord concept. And now you're showing, well, you know, good. Here's, here's how you start. But, you know, you want to get really good? Check out these ideas. These, you know, you know, as how Galper said, you know, Bach was doing the same thing. But now, you know, you've made it accessible to a student in a book and they can make it their own because they can practice it. They can loop it. Um, so this is fantastic. I, I know our listeners are probably curious. Is this the way you're teaching your students at Milton Academy? Yes, in, in somewhat. Um, you know, I have some middle schoolers and um, in COVID era teaching, um, you really have to be very flexible. And also remember, this is really new. So um, even though I know what's in it, I, you know, I'm still taking it out for a test run to see how students work with it. I've actually worked with these concepts for years. In fact, uh, just quickly, I want to tell the story. I was pestering the heck out of smart music. It's like, I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to do this. Make it swing and make it swing. And they found they kept saying, well, no, it, it, we, we can't do that yet. And finally, what they came back to me and they said, you know what? You can't do that. The user can't do that. But we really like what you're doing. Will you write some books for us? And I said, oh, my God, of course I will. So that's how this uh, marriage came about. Um, I do use it with my students. Um, some of my advanced students, we're, we we don't right now. There's only the F blues, and if you want more, maybe you could you know put in requests and and encourage. Um, there's so many different projects that Smart Music works on, and they have to go you know prioritize. Uh, but a song from my father is ready to go, and there's a bass book which I, I'm going to show you in a second. And there's some other tunes, but you know, I hope I hope we can. It's probably going to take a long time to get all 16 books out, but um, the important thing is actually in the F blues. I mean, that's the method. So what I do is uh, we had our students working that in this fall in in the F blues, um, but we you know we're trying to put on uh, remote conference concerts through uh, using you know Soundtrap or Logic and all these kinds of uh, softwares. So we had to move on to other tunes, but the students, I'm trying to get them to carry on the concepts of the F blues to the other tunes. And just an, uh, another word, Ted, um, uh, I feel very lucky. Um, my degrees are in math. I was hired as a full-time math teacher at my school, but I've always been fortunate to, to be playing music. And I was really loved jazz. I didn't know that much about it. I went to Berkeley College of Music for one semester. And um, the school, not knowing I didn't know anything, and I didn't know I didn't know anything, let me start a jazz program in 1974. And I quickly learned that, boy, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know about this thing, or I didn't know about that thing. So I would seek out teachers like Jerry Berganzi or Charlie Bonacus. And then, uh, un unbelievably good fortune, I got hired by Jamie Ebersol in 1980. So I got to learn from him and David Baker and Dan Hurley, Jerry Coker, Rufus Reed, and so Hal Galper. Um, and I've always, you know, just sought out people when I, there's something that I didn't know or wanted to know about, uh, I would seek them out. Also going to the IAJE and the GEN conferences. I can't high recommend enough the uh, GEN conferences. I, that's where I really learned, except it was the bandstand where I got my butt kicked. So I feel like I bring a different kind of, uh, I feel like there's some speed bumps in my uh, learning curve here as I, you know, I'm growing into and continue to grow into be a jazz educator. But I feel like I come in with a different perspective that that's very useful of learning on the bandstand, uh, which is really the best way to learn things. You find inspiration and emulate. Um, just quickly, I want to show you uh, one of these uh, and by the way, we had a, I came to school to do this and uh, we had a font problem and uh, we had some technical problems and we weren't able to deal with. That's why that stuff looks kind of funny. But um, so this is an exercise that. This next exercise I call River. Sorry. 
If you can, Bob, turn the volume up a little. Um, it's adapted from a, a book called Super Chops by a guy named Howard Roberts, who started the Guitar Institute of Technology. Um, and this is an out-of-print book. I looked it up the other day. It's $250. You don't need the book. I will tell you my adaptation of it. Um, the purpose of this exercise is to learn how to flow, to learn how to connect rhythmically, to learn how to hear subdivisions. And um, I, so basically the premise is that uh, I'm going to play a backing track. I'm going to play it a metronome marking 60. Um, and I'm going to play it, uh, I'm going to improvise and I'm going to play eighth notes. Uh, the goal would be to play this for 10 minutes at a time, nonstop. It's challenging for horn players because you got to breathe. Um, but I'm going to just go continuous for eighth notes. Now, I'm not going to play for 10 minutes for you, but I'm just going to give you an idea of how it will work. And um, I put an adaptation in that you don't have to put in, but I'm not going to stay on a note. I'm not going to allow myself to go. I'm going to have to move every eighth note. Um, and the goal is just to keep moving to feel the pulse. The goal is really to change your hearing so you hear eighth note subdivisions. All right? So I'm going to stop it there. And um, when you go to smart music, you can hear the rest of it. But it's a wonderful exercise that uh, it, it changed my music, my music life. And this other one, trans Transition Position, helps piano players learn how to switch their voicings quickly. So lots of good stuff. Um, and, um, there was a video in here that we took out because, uh, for this, um, presentation, uh, where, as Ted said, uh, we're presuming that people know how to use smart music. And if not, there's wonderful resources to learn how to use it. So before we move on, uh, to a much shorter presentation of the walking bass book, here's my information. I'm amazingly available and, uh, love to connect with people. So feel free to email me. Um, my website is there. Um, and um, yeah. So uh, I also proposed a series of walking baseline books. Uh, I run a weekend workshop for Jamie uh, Abersold for bass players, drummers and guitar players. And it, basically, you know, for the week long workshops that start on Monday, we need the bass players to be able to function. And some of them will show up on Saturday morning saying, hey, I bought a bass last week. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh. And so I came up with a, a method that I think is pretty cool of how to create walking bass lines without really knowing that much about the bass, especially if it's an electric bass. So um, again, here's a hyperlink. And uh, here's a, another hyperlink about walking bass lines. And again, there's lots of good information. Um, and um, the first chapter is how to use the roots. I call it roots to roots. There's 11 exercises. And then we add the fifth in. And then we add the third. And then we add the seventh. And then we have one measure patterns. And then we have something where I take, uh, we, we have 18 different uh, choruses uh, that mimic people like Ray Brown, Jimmy Blatton, Ron Carter, Paul Chambers, um, Miroslav Vatus, which is pretty cool. And all the notes stay within the first five frets for electric bass. That was a real challenge. It is a real challenge. Also, although it's not in uh, smart music, tab is available because a lot of bass players don't read. Okay, so um, just to show you some exercises here, how you can create a really functional bass line. What you can do, you can just play all the roots. Hey, you know what? If you go out there and you play these notes with, with vigor, your, your band is going to like it's going to like what you do, so you don't need to get fancy. And again, you won't see the tablature in smart music, but I have um, you know a, a hyperlinks where you can download it from my website. Okay, so let's take that tension release concept and let's go a half step below the root. Um, and so now we get a little bit of interest. Boo dun 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 dun. Oh, that's that it gives us a little information. Of course, ever present hyperlinks. Hey, I like that concept. Let's go two notes below the root. And again, we're getting forward motion. We create tension and we resolve it. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Well, guess what? 
You like two notes before? Let's go three notes before. This is a really good bass line. Um, I mean, I've got lots of recordings where great bass players play this figure. Now, they don't play it for 24 bars, but um, it really works well. And you can see higher in the first chorus, I keep it down here. And then without going over the five frets, or the fifth fret, I just sneak it up when I can just to get, get you really comfortable. I am of the uh, theory that it's better to take little, little bits of material and master it than try to do too many things. Okay, then the next thing is we do is we add the fifth. Um, and it's pretty easy to do on an electric bass. And so you start out like that. Again, if you do that and you do it with vigor and good pulse, your, your group is going to work. They're going to thank you. Here's where we get a little bit more involved, where we're using the concepts of enclosures. So you go low, root, lower chromatic, upper scalar to the fifth. Um, so that's pretty cool. And um, then you can add the third. And again, you can do these little, you know, here's just root three, five, three. Um, and again, here's the octave five, three root. And again, these things are labeled. And, um, and then here you can do root, lower chromatic, third, fifth. There's a lot of variety in here without having to have a whole lot of skill and a whole a lot of whole deep understanding. You can do these exercises if you can find the roots and the fifths and the thirds. You don't have to, you don't have to be reading. Uh, unfortunately, most bass players and guitar players don't read very well, traditional music. Okay. And then you can add the seventh. There's not many tunes. Uh, exercises in there as a bass player of 60 plus years um i don't really think about seven set much uh rufus reed who's another one of my significant teachers said well when i used to play the big letters meaning that that's all he played was the roots uh anyway so there's some exercises there uh just using the you know uh, the seventh and the third yeah the sevenths and then we get into some pretty cool patterns so for instance, this pattern right here is uh it's used a lot in shuffle. Boom, ba da da boom, ba da da boom. Uh, that's really a common one. It's a great one to play in R and B music. Here's some just going down the scale. Um uh, and uh, that's pretty cool. I forget how many there's seven different patterns that I put in. Um and again, they're all within five frets of an electric bass. And then we get to uh, what is pretty cool. Uh, I wanted to give something that would really be uh, substantive and not just repetitive and where you could kind of see how you could put these things together. So I did a lot of research and I created 18 different walking bass lines in the styles of uh, 18 different great bass players, starting with uh, Pops Foster, Walter Page, these are guys from the 20s and the 30s and going up to Miroslav Vatust and um, 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 Ron Carter. And um, it's pretty cool. So here's, here's an example of what Ray Brown might play. Here's an example of what Red Mitchell might play. Here's an example. And so let me play one of these. Uh, let's go to You know, you don't have to worry about the swing. Uh, well, I guess we do a little bit. And here's where you would get the tablature, by the way. All right. So that was a lot of fun, and I, I had some help from a friend of mine who uh, 
he heard about this and without even asking me, he just said, I, I, I want to do this. And he sent me uh, his examples. Um, so we can kind of compile them here. Uh, and here are the bass players. And again, this is a hyperlink. And if you click on any one of these, you go to the Wikipedia page about these bass players. Um, so this is the uh, proposed tunes that uh, the backing tracks are already ready to go. And you, you just heard the guitar drums backing track. Um, and again, the backing tracks are either piano bass drums, guitar bass drums, B3 drums, or bass and drums. Um, and uh, lots of variety. I love this title, All the Dings in Your Car. <laughs> um, you got some clever names there for the tunes. That's really good, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the uh, things that uh, someone asked, they said, is this only available online? And the answer to that question is yes, you, you need smart music subscription to be able to see Bob's and hear Bob's book and to be able to work with it. Um, a subscription for a student is currently $29.99. If you're a teacher and you need a grading book, it's uh, $39.99. Uh, and you can just go to the website and purchase your subscription for a year. And yes, you're going to get um, the availability of Bob's book, but there's also literally thousands of other things in there. Um, there's big band titles to play along with. There's several other jazz improvisation books um, and things. So uh, it's for the money. It's a huge resource um, and, and definitely you know, worth your investment. And then the other uh, question we had, Bob, was somebody was um, interested in your... Um, you know, how did we place the the ranges of the instruments? And I, and I think the answer to that is, we tried to be, I would say, safe. So what that allows you to do, if you have an advanced student, and you've got one of those safe um, exercises, and your student's ready, tell them to read it up the octave, or play it down, whatever it is. Um, so I, I feel like there's a lot of adaptability in the book. Um, it, it's meant, again, to start, you know, out uh, easy and help uh, that beginner out. But boy, it can get advanced as fast as you want it to. Um, which brings us to one more question. Um, the, the question is, do we start on line one and just proceed to the end of the book? How about if you answer that? That's a very good question. Um, the answer is maybe. <laughs> um, for instance, with my middle schoolers, um, you know, they're, our school is a highly, you know, a, charged academic institution. Um, and so, you know, we've produced some amazing musicians, but that's not the goal of our program. And, you know, for middle schoolers, they're not maybe interested in going that deep in the woods of trying to learn how to play thirds and all. But the beauty about smart music is that it's self-paced. You can do that. So um, I would, you know, I start with them with the minor pentatonic and then the minor blues. Uh, if I see a student who, you know, I think, is interested and, and willing to uh, dive in, then I definitely would start with the one chord tone. And you could go through the book, but it, it's not meant to be, um, it, it would be hard to do chapter five <laughs> uh, you know, triads without having done chapter two, the chord tones. But what you could do, and I've got, if you contact me, I can, I've got an alternate way to go through the book. In other words, if you learn the roots and the thirds, you don't have to have the fifths and the sevenths to go do the root third exercise. So if you learn the roots and the thirds, you could actually do the pairs. You could start there. And I've done that with some of my students. Uh, and if you learn the roots and the fifths, then you could do that pair. And if you learn th those two, you could do the thirds and the fifths. So you don't have to wait till you master the single chord tones to be able to, to go. I mean, that only really works between the uh, single chord tone and the pairs of chord tones. Um, so it sounds to me like that's not yeah. true. I'm sorry. If if you learn the roots, third and fifth, you don't have to play the sevenths. You could get into the triads section. Right. So what what you've done is you've lived up to your title of your book. You've provided several pathways. Mm -hmm. All right. So that, I think that's wonderful. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us uh, today. We hope to see you again next time. I want to uh, really thank Bob um, for uh, working so hard to uh, put this book together and uh, bring it to us and for smart music for pulling it into the smart music platform. Um, for all of you that are interested in exposing your students to jazz. This is a really great um, starting point for us. Um, I hope you um, take a look at it. 
And uh, we hope to see you again sometime in the near future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.